So, um, so we're going to talk about lichens and air quality. And um, again, I'm not going to ask you to write a lot down. I'll let you know there's only one thing that you really are going to need to write down. What we're going to talk about, though, is something called air quality. And then we're going to talk about how and why lichens are sensitive to certain substances that might be in the air, or how they might respond to changes in air quality. Um, and what it starts with is, so again, this is not something you have to memorize. This is not something that you need to like be able to talk about intelligently, uh, really on any level. But I think you're ready to think about this kind of thing, because it's kind of interesting. Usually, when we talk about air quality, we say things like, oh, the air quality is good, or the air quality is bad. But in science, when we make qualitative measurements, we're not, we don't mean, when we say qualitative, we don't mean good or bad. We just mean we are like characterizing something, we're characterizing some set of measurements. So when we talk about air quality in science, we're just talking about a whole collective set of measurements that we can make about air and, and the stuff in air. When we talk about things being good or bad, those are not the measurements themselves. We characterize air quality with measurements. And then we may, as humans, describe things as good or bad. But there's always some sort of additional information that goes on with that. So for example, a lot of times we look at air quality for some particular purpose. Usually, it's us. Usually, what we care about with air quality is whether or not it's air that's good for us to breathe or whether it's potentially harmful to some or all people in, in, a, in an area. And so when we talk about good and bad air quality, 98% of the time, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about like how it, is it going to affect humans. Um, but it's interesting because there are places that have very different air quality than what humans are used to. But that air quality isn't necessarily bad. So for example, if you look at, um, at air quality around geologic hotspots, like if you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, the hot springs, the mud pits, um, the pools, all of those um, areas have, um, have very, naturally, have very high concentrations of sulfur compounds in the air. It stinks. It smells like rotten eggs. Nobody likes to breathe it. But that air quality isn't poor. We would say, ew, this air is terrible. This stinks. But that is the way it's been. The organisms that live in that area have adjusted to or even adapted to that level of air quality. The organisms that live in the pools themselves, right? Like that's not air, that's water. They, they have to be able to live with the stuff in that water. But the organisms that live outside of that water have to be adapted to breathing that air, whether they're plants that don't technically respire, like pul they don't have pulmonary lung-based respiration, but they do gas exchange, or whether it's a centipede. Or a, um, or a beetle or some other organism that lives in the environment. And um, so, so when we think about good or bad air quality, it's not just good or bad. It's good or bad for some particular kind of thing. Those are relative terms. We can also characterize air quality by just talking about numbers. We could characterize the air quality in this room by measuring the amount of oxygen. Oxygen is in air that we breathe. And, um, and we might measure it, and that would characterize the air quality. If we were to talk about the air quality in this room as being good or bad, that really wouldn't change anything. Like the air quality in this room for, for humans is fine. We could still measure the amount of oxygen in it and track how that changes. What we'd see, of course, is when people come in, the amount of oxygen drops, the amount of carbon dioxide goes up. Does that make the air quality bad? No. Does it make it worse? No, actually, it's fine. It's good. It's fine for breathing. But it's a little bit different than it was when nobody was in before. And there are places where you have to be careful how many people are in a space because carbon dioxide can spike so high that actually it can start to impair people's ability to um, extract oxygen from the air. So you'll find in certain places there are 
people or systems that are designed to measure carbon dioxide to make sure that it doesn't spike and, and become um, unhealthy for humans to breathe. Um, one of the characterizations, one of the sets of measurements that we can make when we talk about air quality has to do with pollutants. Pollutants are things that we find in air that wouldn't be there in the absence of human activities. So that's another kind of cool thing to think about because usually we think about like, well, smoke, that's terrible, right? Well, not necessarily. Um, there are places in the world that historically, like long before human beings, had frequent fires. Areas where there's thunderstorms, for example, places where, where there's that sort of hot, humid climate. Thunderstorms are frequent, fires are frequent, smoke is very common in those areas. Is that a pollutant? I mean, not, not really, because it's there naturally. Now, if a human being causes a fire, and that causes a lot of smoke, or the actions of human beings cause there to be way more smoke than there normally would be, then we might categorize that smoke as a pollutant. But there's all sorts of stuff in air naturally, even long before there were human beings, there were all sorts of things in the air. Volcanic eruptions would occur and put things like sulfur dioxide in the air, which is there. And that was not pollution because it was not caused by humans. It was a perfectly natural, event that, that happened in the absence of human beings. But now that humans are in so many places and we care so much about well, what are we breathing, like what is going into our lungs and how does that affect our health, we care a lot about some specific pollutants. And again, I want to emphasize, you don't need to memorize this stuff, but I think this is the kind of stuff that even hearing this, you've heard it once already, but hearing it twice is going to give you something. It's going to give you a little hook in your brain. That's how I think about stuff like this. You're not going to remember this specifically in two weeks or two years. Like if I were to ask you, what are the pollutants that we talked about in biology? You're going to look at me and be like, I don't remember. But if it comes up again, if you read something in the newspaper, if you read about a volcanic eruption, or you read about car exhaust, or you take another class, like an environmental science class, where they look at this kind of thing a lot, you'll have a little hook in your brain that is ready to think about this in more detail. So it's worth talking about, even though I'm not going to ask you to remember this or directly apply it. Um, so one of the categories of pollutants are particulates. Those are things that are actual tiny chunks of stuff, smoke, um, exhaust can be like that. And we think about exhaust as being a gas because we smell the fumes, but actually there's a lot of particulate matter in exhaust. That's why you get a lot of like darkening of surfaces in areas where there's lots of cars. The exhaust comes out and there's little tiny pieces of like partially combusted or even uncombusted oil. And that is dark and black. And it gets like deposited on surfaces. So you like if you look at buildings in cities, they're just covered with like a sort of a black, like smeary, oily goo. Um, and it's not it's not like thick, it's not like a thick layer where you're like stepping in and feeling it underneath you, but it's there and, and you can you can see it, you can clean it off. They clean off buildings from time to time and then they're just it's they're like white. You know, if there were like a marble building, you'd get washed in. It'd be white underneath in the morning. Uh, another example is something that um, we often don't think of as a pollutant, and that's ozone. Ozone is something that is present throughout our atmosphere. It turns out that ozone in the very highest part of the atmosphere is kind of good. It provides some protection against UV radiation, which is good for humans and many other organisms because it helps protect us from skin cancer. But lower down in the atmosphere, Ozone is a problem. It's pretty reactive. It's not great to breathe, and it can react with other things in the air to make worse stuff. Um, and so that comes from cars and factories. Um, we also get nitrogen dioxide, which comes from vehicles and factories. And nitrogen dioxide is interesting because this isn't particularly harmful directly. What nitrogen dioxide generally does is it provides essentially like a fertilizer boost to certain things. So the problem with nitrogen dioxide isn't that it's like 
bad for some things, it's that it's too good for certain things. And it causes other things to maybe grow at a rate that sort of throws off the ecological balance. And we'll, we're, we're not going to look at this directly, but we'll see some examples of things like this when we start talking about food webs and food chains. Uh, carbon monoxide, this one is deadly. And interestingly, carbon monoxide is not something that we need to worry about outdoors. The amount of carbon monoxide that gets released into the atmosphere is t vanishingly small. We don't have to worry about it outside of enclosed spaces. But even though the amount of carbon monoxide that gets released from like vehicles and factories is really small, um, in an enclosed space, it can build up. It doesn't build up. To a, to a level that is like looks high numerically, but it's really dangerous for organisms, people, and lots of other animals. Um, and what, because it prevents our blood from carrying oxygen. So people die from carbon monoxide poisoning. I have one of my former students, super smart kid, really, really like mechanical, loved to work on his cars. Um, several years ago, he was working on one of his cars in the winter and got cold. He closed the garage. And he just didn't think about it. He left, he left the vehicle's engine running. And he passed away because of carbon monoxide poisoning. So this stuff, indoors, is a big deal. Outdoors, not so much of a big deal. And then sulfur dioxide, this is one that can cause problems. There's, this is one that um, can kind of interfere with biological processes. This one is one that we worry about with lichens. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So again, you don't have to write this down, but I think it's kind of cool to just sort of think about, there's, there's way more things, right? Like there's way more chemicals that get into our air from human activities, but it's kind of interesting to just sort of think about a few of these things and have just a little bit of information that's just there in, in your brain now um, for, for possible future use. When we think specifically about lichens, it turns out that um, Lichens are particularly sensitive to certain things in the air. And here's when we get into the whole mechanism thing. And I think this is really fun because like we, we've known this for a long time. People knew, like people like 200 years ago, 400 years ago, noticed, oh hey, when we have these settlements where there's lots of like burning wood or burning coal, which was pretty much all there was 400 years ago, uh, then we don't see as many of certain kinds of lichens. Well, they thought they were plants, so they would just be like, well, we just don't see so many of these plants. That's interesting, but they didn't know why. Even when we discovered that lichens are a, really not an organism, but they're a combination of a fungus and some sort of photosymbiotic something or other, like an algae or a bacteria that can photosynthesize, um, we still didn't know exactly why it was that they were sensitive, but now we do. Here's why. It's because, remember I mentioned like when we first talked about lichens that the algae part of it is kind of wimpy. It, it's not super sturdy. Algae, need, they need to be surrounded by water. They need to have pretty good conditions. They photosynthesize, so they need sunlight. And if they dry up or they're exposed to stuff, they, they're pretty fragile and they don't survive. Fungi are super sturdy. On the other hand, they, nothing really bothers a fungus. It just it decomposes organic material, and it's kind of hard to kill them. And so they're they're really tough, but they can't photosynthesize. So the beauty of the symbiotic partnership that is a lichen is that you have this really sturdy external structure that's created by the fungus, and it protects the internal structure, which is the algae or the cyanobacteria, which can photosynthesize and provide a whole bunch of food. And the thing about that arrangement is that those algae are still their own living organisms, which means, just like any other living organism, they need to be able to exchange gas. They need to be able to, to either receive oxygen or emit oxygen or receive carbon dioxide or emit carbon dioxide. That means that during conditions that are good for photosynthesis, like moist conditions where there's enough light, the fungus that surrounds the algae in a lichen partnership is going to open up a little bit. We can't see it with our unaided eye, 
we can't really even see it with microscopes, like regular light microscopes, but with high power microscopes, what we can see is that fungus is like a sponge. It's porous. Air can get in and out. Now, if conditions are bad, it locks down. The fungus kind of locks down. It keeps moisture inside so that algae doesn't die, but it also prevents carbon dioxide and oxygen from being exchanged, which is no big deal because conditions aren't any good anyway, so that algae wouldn't be photosynthesizing anyway. But when conditions are good, that sponge-like aspect of the fungus kind of opens up a little bit and gas starts to freely move in and out of the fungus. Well, the problem with that is anything else is going to get in there too. So if we have certain pollutants in the air and that, that fungal protective layer of the lichen opens up, then all those pollutants get right in where they can get right at the algae. And some of the lichens that we're looking at have algal or cyanobacterial partners that are pretty sensitive to certain pollutants in the air. Typically, they're sensitive to sulfur dioxide. That's, that's one that's particularly harmful to many of the lichens that we're looking at. And not all of the lichens we're looking at have, have a big problem with it. It turns out that Loberia does. Loberia pulmonaria is really sensitive, especially to sulfur dioxide. Ramelina menziesii, the fishnet lichen, is also pretty sensitive. And Usnea is reasonably sensitive. The other ones, eh, not so much. So what we are going to be looking at is this. If we collect sticks close to areas of pollution, like we did on Monday, and we compare the amount of lichens that are pollution sensitive on those sticks to sticks that were collected far away from pollution, which is what we're going to do today, do we see a difference in their abundance? So on Monday, we were by the road, and we collected some sticks, and we made our data tables, and we figured out what percentage of each of our lichens was on there. Today, we're going to go out to the ash swale, which is pretty far from the road, and we're going to collect sticks, and we're going to make a data table of those. As well. What I want you to write down is this. This is our study question. What is the relationship between the abundance of pollution-sensitive lichens and their proximity to sources of air pollution? We talked about this with the, with the aquatic macroinvertebrate study. It's easy to forget kind of like what we're doing. We get kind of locked into some measurements that we're making and specific tasks. Really what we want to find out is if we think about the lichens that are most sensitive to pollution, Loberia, Ramelina M, and Usnea, do we see changes in their abundance when we get real close to the road where there's lots of cars, lots of pollution from the cars, versus when we're far away from the road? The Ash Swale, where there's some vehicles that drive by there on Crescent Valley Drive, but there's, they're not as close and there's not nearly as many cars. 